All right, well, let's get started. So a few questions about <clears throat> lab two. One is uh, you're going you're gonna to need to get audio codec stuff, audio codec code from the DSP page. And there's five, four or five files that you need. You need the you need the reset generator, you need the audio phase lock loop, you need the I2C controller, the I2C configurer, and the DAC ADC interface. I think there's five pieces that you need. And the very first thing I would do to test that all would be, and I think they're all zipped up on that page also, the very first thing I would do would be to hook up an audio line to the to the one of the inputs and write a piece of Verilog that does nothing but to hook the input back to the output. And then take the output and hook it onto a scope. Now, remember, this is an audio level codec. The maximum voltage it can record is about plus minus one volt. If you pop that thing with 15 or 20 volts off of the signal generator, you're liable to blow up the interface. So, so hook the input to the scope before you hook it to the uh, DS, to the uh, DE2. About one scope, one volt, plus minus one volt peak to peak sine waves are a good test. Loop them in, see if you can loop them back out. If you do that, then you know that the whole inter all the whole hardware interface is working back to the outside, independent of the CPU, independent of everything else. This is just a hardware. Then the next step is to add a CPU and loop it in through the CPU and back out again. Do a read and a write, just a input and an output, loop it back out, <coughs> same deal. And at this point also, you're probably going to get the, want to get the timing right. Doing the handshake or the timing, whatever you want to call it, for, um, for uh, probably synchronizing with the DAC left-right clock. So I would do loop back before anything else. First in hardware, then through the CPU. Another question was, can you run the same code on both CPUs? And the answer is yes, I believe so. You have to have one CPU for the right channel, one for the left channel. And you do have to toggle. <clears throat> I think left, right clock is left is high, right is low, if I remember right. And you might think that, well, you want to synchronize one CPU on this edge and the other CPU on this edge, but of course you can always put in an extra hardware inverter on the input of the CPU, and then you can run exactly the same code from the same memory image file on both CPUs. You don't have to have a version number you're working on keeping in sync. So I would do that. <coughs> A couple of people have said that they, they ran into an error, something like uh, found no memory image file or image file not available or something of that sort. Has anybody seen that and know how to solve it? Because I haven't seen it and so I don't know how to solve it. And so either the first either the first fix was a magic incantation or there's at least two things wrong. Uh, did closing Cordis and reopening it fix it? Oh my. I don't know. How did you fix it? Or did you? We left last night. I see, that's when you went home. <laughs> oh dear. I, I don't know what the answer is. Uh like I said, I haven't seen that happen. Um, There could be a naming issue. 
uh, make sure the names match. I'm sure you did that already, though. Yeah. I don't know what the answer is there. There is push immediate. Push immediate takes a 12-bit argument. And the way I implemented constants The way I implemented constants is that when you associate a label with a value, this value has to fit into 12 bits. Note also that this 12-bit value is sign extended, two complement sign extended to 18 bits, so that any number over to the 11th minus 1 gets wrapped to a negative number. So really these constants are good for small constants, say less than 2047. I modified the compiler so that if you write a number in line in the code, if you write a, 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 a literal in the code, in the range of plus minus one three one thousand one hundred thirty one thousand and change uh, that's uh, two to the seventeenth then the compiler does the correct thing and stores it as an eighteen bit number and the way it does it is the same way that you could do it if you wanted to do it manually and that is, you break the 18-bit number into two pieces, you load the high order digits, the high order bits of the number into the lower 12 bits, you shift them left and you OR it with the lower byte, lower bits. So I just implemented that into the compiler. So 18-bit two's complement numbers can be used directly in line in the code, but not in the constant block. I may or may not get around to fixing that. Probably will. But I ran out of time yesterday. Any more questions about Lab 2? Anybody got it all running yet? Anybody have loop back through the CPU running? That's all working as advertised. No weird timing issues or anything. Yeah, so once you get to this point, then you've then you've I think there are four there are four filter conditions you have to produce for the lab. One is loop back. Ah, that one's done. And now you have to do the high pass, the low pass, and the band pass. Has anybody run into the problem of, has anybody modified the multiplier yet? To 216 or anybody run into a problem where they need to? Don't know yet. There is an alternative to, to changing the multiplier and that is to downsample. Instead of, <laughs> instead of, instead of filtering it at 48 kilohertz, if all I'm asking for is a 500 hertz low pass filter, then in principle, the highest speed sample you need is around 1,000 hertz. 48 kilohertz is gross overkill. You could downsample a factor of four and make all of your timing, all, not timing requirements, but all of your uh, bit requirements somewhat more relaxed. And you might be able to get away with an 8-bit multiplier. I'll talk about that if you want to. Uh, anything else on lab two? With the Butterworth uh, filter condition, right? Uh, the scaling of 
4 was applied, 2 power minus 2, basically the right shifted by uh, 2 bits, followed, following that left shift of 16 was done. Uh, I think that is to get it in the range of minus 1 to 1. Wait, 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 wait. This is in the um, uh, the MATLAB code? I mean, it's done in one code. It is not done in another set of code. Like, there were two or three samples of the MATLAB code. Uh, there, were, there were some of the MATLAB codes uh, do truncation after a certain number of bits, and some are exact. And so it depends on, on which ones you, you're looking at. But all those are aimed at the hardware filters, not the so not software filters. Although you can certainly copy the hexadecimal values out of the out of that interface, or you could modify the MATLAB code to give you the the hexadecimal directly. Um, yes, let's say let's say that you've set up 2.16 number system for your arithmetic and you find that one of the coefficients is 4.16 that you need for the filter. You can no longer represent 4 in this number system. And so you have to divide this by at least 2. So you may have to shift, right shift it by 2, which is the equivalent. If you right shift all of the coefficients by 2, it's the equivalent of setting A1 to 0.25. Normally MATLAB sets A1 to be exactly 1 and scales everything else. But if you took A1 to be 0.25, you could shift everything to the right and make it fit into a 216 format. And then at the very last step, you have to divide by 0.25 to get the new y, because remember a1 multiplies yn. We want yn, then we have to divide through by 0 0.25, which means we have to multiply the result by 4, which is a shift 2, which is very easy. Shift left 2. <coughs> so, <coughs> excuse me, some of them were scaled by a couple of bits to do that, so that you could, you could fit bigger coefficients in. Now, whether or not you're going to do that, depend, have to do that, depends on the number system that you choose. If you find you need a, a range of plus minus 4, why not just set this to um, 412 format? Since you, can, since you have complete control, godlike control over the hardware, you can do anything you want. Just make the multiplier what you need, whatever that happens to be. Anything else? That, does that answer what you, yeah. Okay. So the new, the new compiler, freshly baked over the weekend, is designated 1.1. But just to be on the safe side, I left the 1.0 version also linked up. Anything else on lab two? Well, let's go back to talking about lab three then. So I talked about lab three a little bit on, on Friday. The idea that we're gonna solve the we're gonna solve the wave equation on a uh, rectangular domain. And so each one of these nodes, then, if we turn this sideways and look at the edge, then each one of these nodes can move up and down. We're going to get some complicated set of nodes as these, as some complicated set of modes as these nodes move up and down. Um, for a given resolution grid, you clearly can't have a frequency on the grid which is higher than half the uh, grid spacing. So with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
the highest mode we can get in this direction would be a third harmonic. But drums can move as a unit, right? They can move out of phase. They can move in extremely complicated ways, and each one of those has a different sound to it. What I'm going to ask you to do for this particular problem is to not drive the drum in a, in a completely general fashion, but be able to take one node and move it. And the way you're going to do this is you're going to push the button and a distribution of amplitudes is going to be injected into the array of, of nodes which will then evolve in time. <clears throat> to avoid aliasing, to avoid harsh sounds, you have to, let's look at now just a one-dimensional cross-section of this grid. The very minimum you need to do to, for an initial condition is you have to produce a triangle of amplitudes which is three samples across. Peak, half, zero. It's even better if you take peak, half, quarter, eighth. One, one, half. Ye gods. That was horrible. Let's do that again. One, one half, one fourth, one eighth. In other words, have them drop off exponentially like that. If you want to do even better for an initial condition, you can go for a Gaussian. But you have to have a width of at least three points. You have to have at least one, one half, zero to avoid gross aliasing on the grid. So when you press the button, some point on the grid is going to be lifted to an amplitude of one, and the four points around it, minimum four points around it, are going to be lifted to an amplitude of one half. You let go of the button, and the drum starts to evolve in time and that energy spreads out into various wave modes. Clearly, where you touch the drum changes it. If you, if you, see, if you hit in the center versus an edge, you get different excitation of, the, of modes of the drum. You can choose, I'm going to simplify this, if you wish, you can choose to excite in only one position. You choose it. In a real drum, the air pressure that's developed is proportional to the, over a small piece of the drum, is proportional to the velocity of the drum. Um, but, and you have to sort of integrate that over the whole drum surface to get the power output from the drum. But we're going to do, again, the simplest possible approximation of that. And that is to say, we're going to record the amplitude at one position on the drum head, unless you, feel it, unless you feel like you want to sum up a few different positions. Then you probably get a better sound, but it's more work. Let's say if you wanted to uh, add those five and divide by five, you'd probably get a, different, a better sound out. But it is sufficient for the purposes of the lab exercise to record the amplitude at one point on the drum and feed that to the audio codec. Because you're, after all, you're going to listen to it. The arbiter of reality here is your ear. If it sounds right, it's right. If it sounds like fingernails on a blackboard, it's probably not right. 
And it will happen. So, excite at one spot with a fairly simple kind of envelope, which could be the center also. You could excite at the center and then record at the center. It's up to you. Or any of these could be choosable. And I think it says that there has to be at least two different drum sounds available. Um, so what are the parameters that you can control here? One is the speed of sound on the, on the surface of the drum. So there's going to be some parameter rho, or if you, uh, which is a normalized version of the speed of sound. If you lower the speed of sound, then all the changes get slower and you expect the frequency to go down. And so you can change the timbre of the drum. Another possibility is to change the shape of the drum or the size. You double the size, the pitch is going to drop by a factor of two. All the modes get longer. If you change from a square to a rectangle, you're going to get a different distribution of modes. If you change the boundary conditions, you're going to get a different set of modes. So for a drum head, as we said on Friday, the boundary conditions are going to be that all of these points around the edge are at zero. U equals zero on the boundary. <coughs> so, those will be nodes that you never update. Right? They're fixed at zero. Or thinking in terms of interior nodes, let's say we have an interior node, one of whose gets one input from an edge. This, the input here will always be zero, but this node does not have to be explicitly modeled. Just a zero is always going to be injected into this interior mode. If you have a free edge, an unconstrained edge, you hold a big piece of steel up in the air and you wham it with a hammer, um, the edges vibrate. They're essentially unconstrained by air. But the normal the derivative normal to the edge must be zero in that case because to get curvature here, to get curvature requires a force. If there's no force on the edge, there can't be any curvature. So the, so the derivative must be zero on the edge. Another way of saying that is that the, that the edge of the drum must have the same value as the next internal node, which means if we are looking at an internal node, again with an edge over here, that we're going to, what's going to come back from the input to this is going to be the value u. In other words, it's going to be reflected back through this loop and back in. So a free boundary is zero slope and has a value which is the same as the internal node. You could make a partly free boundary by doing a linear combination of those. You could take a fraction of u and feed it back. The fraction could measure, you could go from zero fraction, in which case it's a fixed boundary, to a, a unity fraction, in which case it's a free boundary, but you could have a, a half free boundary. 
In fact, you could have a twice free boundary. So it's an amplifier at the edge. What would you think would probably happen if you did that? The system would, would diverge, right? It would grow without bound. It would probably sound just awful. And in fact, you can try it with the MATLAB, and it does. There's a MATLAB simulator that allows, yeah. Ooh. And, it, and of course, it really in real life, it really does, uh, because there's some stiffness in the membrane. Um, um, yeah, you could mix them like that if you wanted to. You don't have to for this lab. So, given that we have, and I'm going to ask you to do at least a, a 10 by 10 grid. The cutoff for acceptability is 10 by 10. And so that's enough to match to, to get five harmonics on the, on, the, on the drum head. That's enough to make it sound drum-like. I spent way too much time having fun with the MATLAB code before I played around anymore with the hardware. You can make sounds that sound like bells, which is a little surprising because bells have a different topology, right? Bells are, are, are connected around the edge. And so you can only get harmonics on them that are cylindrically connected, what are those called? Cylindrical harmonics? Legendre polynomials? So, is that right? It's been a while. And then people also do hemispherical bowls which have yet a different set of constraints on them. Um, but in this, but you can get, make something that sounds pretty bell-like with just a flat sheet if you get the boundary conditions right. You can make things that sound gong-like, uh, sound kind of like breaking glass. Uh, very entertaining. But we need a scheme that's efficient and simple for updating these internal nodes. Right, so we have to, we need a system that will update the internal nodes while satisfying the wave equation. So if so if actually let's do it this way. So the acceleration then, partial of u with respect to t squared is the acceleration is going to be given by second derivative of the position in each direction and we're going to throw in a damping term here which represents some sort of loss some sort of viscous friction where this is some kind of uh, friction drag. And let's put in a 1 over c squared just to get the units right here. <coughs> More speed, c is the speed of sound on the grid. And what we want to do is approximate this in some fashion so that we can evolve waves. This should all look, this probably looks sort of nauseatingly familiar from some uh, fields and waves class or, or elementary electromagnetism class and you probably solved it by Fourier expansion on a on a rectangular domain something like that but we're not going to do anything analytical here rather we're going to notice a couple of things numerically about this <clears throat> and that is, one is we can approximate 
of the first the second derivative as the difference of two differences. So we can approximate this as u, let's say that we have the i plus first time sample, so i is a is a time uh, variable <coughs> minus u i over delta t minus ui minus ui minus 1 over delta t all over delta t is approximately equal to the partial of u squared with respect to t squared. Partial squared u with respect to t squared. So this is an approximation of the second derivative. Right? That's a first derivative. That's a first derivative in time. The difference of the first derivatives divided by the time is the second derivative. So look for, yeah. We can do the same operation with each of the space derivatives also, but now taking the derivative with respect to the appropriate space direction as opposed to the time direction. So we can write up something equivalent for each of these terms. Need to be a little careful about this term because this has the nice symmetry that it's centered around t equals i. It's symmetric around t equals i. And we want the first derivative to be the similarly symmetrical around t equals i. And so what we need to do is to use a approximation of the derivative which skips a step. So instead of taking the derivative at point i, instead of saying the derivative is approximated by, by a, a step back in time or a step forward in time, what we're going to say is we're going to average across i minus 1 to i plus 1 and take delta t as 2 delta t and sort of smooth over that break at, at i and make the make the uh, the term symmetric around the ith sample in time. Any questions about this? So if we were to write this whole thing out, expand this all in terms of delta t and delta x and delta y, make a difference equation out of it, <clears throat> we'd get this gigantic thing. But I'm not going to do that. Rather, I'm just going to give you the, the bottom line, the, uh, the solution to the thing. And here we're going to parameterize. We're going to say rho is going to be defined as C delta T over delta X squared. So rho is related to the speed of sound in some weird units. And what we're going to find that for stability, for stability, that this has to be less than 0 0.5, strictly less than 0 0.5. <coughs> I think that's called the Courant condition. And when we saw this monster differ difference equation, which you can see in more detail in one of the online links, what we get is, now we're going to, where the notation is going to be u time x coordinate y coordinate so it's going to be three indices so 
u of n plus 1, this is the next time step for the index i j, i comma j. So for a given grid point, i comma j, the way we update it is by finding the value at the next time step. And we have to do this separately for each i and j, of course. There's going to be some factor 1 plus eta delta t over 2 minus 1. Curly brackets, row, square brackets, u, n, i plus 1, j, <coughs> excuse me, plus u, n, i minus 1, j, plus u, n, i, j plus 1, plus u, n, i, j minus 1, minus 4, u, n, i, j, n square brackets, plus Two U N I J minus one minus eta delta T over two U N minus one I J curly brackets. Hmm. Hmm. Can you read all of it? The signal of noise is a little high over on that, or a little low over on the end of the board where the chalk dust is thick. But there's a couple of observations. One is, it's a linear equation which means that the values of the inputs are only multiplied by constants. So in principle, you need not use a multiplier because constants can always be represented as shifts and adds. Secondly, there's kind of an appealing symmetry you have the sum of all the nearest neighbors. Oh, isn't that nice? That's kind of like the, the new value is the mean of all the neighbors minus the current value. This is kind of, if you think of these as springs, this is really the length of four springs, right? And the more you stretch the springs, the bigger that term is. This, so this is kind of a, these are all the first differences from the, from the nearest neighbors here. And then these two are related to the to the um, um, damping. Secondly, of course, you're never going to do a reciprocal here, really. You're never going to do a divide because you can always take the reciprocal and do a multiply. Eta, the damping is going to be fairly small, fairly small number. Because if it weren't, the drum wouldn't, wouldn't make a nice sound, right? It'd go thump. Instead of going boom, right? it would do, instead, of, instead of making a nice damp sine wave, if eta is too big, you're going to get something that looks like that. It's going to sound better if eta is fairly small. If eta is small, then it's easy to calculate the Taylor expansion of the reciprocal. Right? 
So 1 plus x to the minus 1, if x is small, is approximately equal to 1 minus x. So, so there's no reason to do a divide here. You just have to Taylor expand that as long as eta is small. And so this is going to come down to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 adds a shift by 2 here, a shift by 2, a multiplication by rho, which probably is going to be a combination of shifts and adds, and a multiply by a couple of constants. So it's something like 10 or 15 operations that have to be done on the nearest neighbors. So the only information you need, again, if this is ij, the only thing you need to know to update, update this node is the four, the four nearest neighbors and the value one time step ago, which I'm not seeing in here, and that bothers me. Oh, there it is, n minus 1, yes, okay. And so you need to know five values. You need to know the value of this one time step ago plus the four nearest current neighbors. You need to do about 10 operations. And so I think most of you could write a state machine that does this. Getting the arithmetic right is kind of annoying. Because you're going to have to, you, and so you're going to have to figure out whether or not first design, design decision is fixed point, fixed point, or floating point. How many bits are you going to keep if it's floating point or fixed point? Are you going to go for 100 bit arithmetic or 5 bit arithmetic? Doesn't matter. On, a C, on, a, on an FPGA, you can do whatever you want. Do you want the more the more accurate arithmetic you use? Uh, you might guess the better it's going to sound. The better the and what what will actually matter is when the amplitude gets low, you'll get smaller truncation error, and so you'll get a, a longer tail out there. If you don't carry very many bits, you'll find it goes and drops suddenly to zero because you've rounded to zero. So you might get a better sounding exponential tail if you carry a few more bits. Does that matter? Well, hmm. Interesting. Don't know. You're going to want to optimize how you do arithmetic here so that you can as much as possible make these into combinations of shifts and adds rather than doing full formal multiplies because you might find you run out of multipliers. This architecture we're using right now has 35 hardware multipliers, 18-bit multipliers. Ooh, but we have new boards. We have some DE2115 boards. This is the upgrade. 115 has 480 multipliers. <laughs> um, you can use the boards for this lab if you want. You can use the big boards. If somebody wants to do that, I'd like to talk to them about the board first. Maybe in lab this Friday we should go over the new board. You could use the 9-bit floating point I wrote the 18-bit floating point that Schuyler wrote. You could write your own floating point. A little tedious. 
24-bit floating point. You could use IEEE 24-bit floating point, which is available as part of the library, but that's huge. But maybe on the big board, it doesn't matter as much. Um, you could do it in fixed point, 18-bit fixed point arithmetic, or maybe 20-bit fixed point arithmetic. You could arrange everything. Ah, yes, since everything is fractional arithmetic, we could say that we have a range of plus minus one and avoid overflows by doing fractional multiplies. So you could arrange everything as uh, 2.18 or 1.19 or 1.23 fixed point. You could do it however it works for you. But what you're going to need to do is implement this as fast as you possibly can. It may mean doing it in parallel on 100 different processors. I've seen people do it that way. Build 100 state machines and run a copy on every state machine. I've seen people divide the grid into pieces and do communication between pieces. If you're actually going to build 100 state machines, you're going to want to look at the generate command. It is, it is a standard command in Verilog 2001, and it allows you to write a loop that generates parameterized hardware. So you can build, expect to build a hundred of these things without cutting and pasting the code a hundred times. The Verilog code. And I'll talk more about that. So clear what we want to do here. And we want to get done with this Saturday. As soon as you're done with lab two, you need to start on lab three, because otherwise you won't finish. This is quite hard. You can, you can build, you can use the CPUs we've just been using in this lab. You can use the CPUs from lab two. They're fast enough that you could expect to update They run at 75 megahertz. You could expect to update uh, maybe um, 100 nodes on one CPU. You have to keep the state. You have to keep is the the values of the node, the values of the nodes at t at t minus one. You need uh, a few other variables. Um, so you're probably going to need. Um, a minimum of four M4K blocks of memory, <coughs> thousand words of memory. So you could build probably, you could build maybe twenty-five of these things, maybe on the on the board. Each updating a hundred nodes. If you could figure out the communication between them, there'd be plenty of bandwidth. Communication becomes critical. So, your, your design decisions, which you can start thinking about now while you're coding lab two, because it kind of uses a different part of your brain to do this kind of design. Fixed point versus floating point. How are you going to do the multiplies? And are you going to go fine-grained state machines? Or are you going to go coarse-grained with CPUs? It's up to you. You can do it any way that works. All we care about is throughput. Total number of nodes per second which are updated. Everybody have an opinion?
given the nature of the communication, given that it's all local communication, nearest neighbor communication, to me it's a little easier to think about fine grain than coarse grain because it's sort of natural that you build, you build a little state machine that looks at its four nearest neighbors and it's very uniform and easy to, to code. But I can't, I don't know whether this is just my personality, which is to do saying things in a fairly simple-minded manner, or, or whether it's actually a good way to look at it. So up to you. Do it however you want. Questions? Any more questions? Does it come? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Any more questions about lab two? Okay. Let's get out of here.